Okay. I'm sorry I could not be with you today in person. Duties in the US won't permit me. And that's not said lightly. These conferences play a critical role in the Australian defence debate. They are an important part of the formulation of our policy. They reach into the Australian political community, and that is a community where the debate on the application of Australia's scant resources sees many contending worthy advocates compete with the interests of our national security. Defence has got one important asset. That is the fact that if we cannot survive, if our interests are not protected, all else falls. Australia's founders recognised this when they acknowledged that the need for a national defence was one of the most important considerations in determining an Australian Federation. Now between 1983 and 1996, the RAN's mission as a tool of statecraft, both in terms of national policy and maritime power projection, was defined in terms of a national strategy of defence self-reliance and a military strategy of defence in depth. The focus was on the capacity to dominate Australia's air and sea approaches and ensure a favourable environment in areas of Australia's strategic interest. The one covered an area that constituted 10% of the Earth's surface. The other, 25% of the Earth's surface. The government's 1987 and 1994 White Papers acknowledged Australia had broader interests, particularly as they reflected the sea lines of communication, which as a trading nation were vital to us. The capacity to act with allies and our interests through that in global and regional stability belied any notion that we could simply rely on a fortified nation and ignore developments abroad to protect significant national interests. Nothing was more bogus than the criticism that planning for our Navy's role was a product of a fortress Australia mentality. The 1987 White Paper made clear that the Radford Collins Agreement, for example, of the early 1950s, gave Australia major responsibilities for the protection of sea lanes in the Eastern Indian Ocean, the Southeast Asian Archipelago, and the Western Pacific. On our eyes, the 1987 White Paper stated this. The type of Australian force structure required to protect our interests in our area of military interest entail substantial capabilities for operations further afield. For example, our guided missile frigates, FFGs, equipped with Seahawk helicopters, are capable of effective participation in a US carrier battle group well distant from Australian shores. Now this was an attribute well tested in the Persian Gulf during the Kuwait War during this period of time. In terms of regional diplomacy, these distant attributes of the RAN were likewise tested in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific over the same 13 year period. But they were part of a force structure defined in terms of dominance of our maritime approaches and the creation of favourable circumstances in our area of direct military interest was neither here nor there when it came to whether or not uh, our Navy was capable of being deployed on a much broader basis. A uh, broader that is than 25% of the Earth's surface where it had to be deployed. The notion of self-reliance, because it was heavily part of the 1987 White Paper, was strongly associated in the public mind and in political debate with the Labor Party. Partly that was a product of what had been perceived as an internal political fix for a party which then had intensely debated one expeditionary activity in Vietnam. Certainly these issues had been important in Labor's internal debate. But more important than Labor's internal debate was a statement by US President Nixon at Guam in 1969, reiterated when I was Defence Minister by then Defence Secretary Cap Weinberger in 1984 that in areas of lesser importance in the Cold, World struggle, Cold War struggle, 
the US expected friends and allies to look to the defense, their own defense, in the first instance. Inhabiting one of those areas, this was a challenge to Australia in the prevailing US concept of allied burden sharing. It did not mean that the US would offer no help to such allies in extremity. It just meant that they could not use the US as an excuse to assume a permanent peace dividend. Nor was it an excuse to ignore an obligation to help a stretched United States economically, militarily and politically elsewhere when occasion demanded. Building alliances and relationships in the Western interest was a core element of the alliance we were and are part of. Australia's Navy was an important part of building that process. It was part of an independent Australian contribution which served a broader Western strategic interest. It envisaged also a collaborative role further afield. Further, as the 1987 White Paper acknowledged, responding to these considerations was first outlined in the 1976 White Paper of Malcolm Fraser's Liberal Government. Not acknowledged in the White Paper, but nevertheless dimly perceived in the 1980s, by the 1980s government, the notion of the need for self-reliance had in fact entered Australia's strategic planning well before Nixon's Guam Doctrine, though it obviously had to after that. When the preceding Dib Review looked closely at Australia's air, naval and army requirements, we were surprised at how much of the thin force structure actually fitted in to the more stringent assessment of defence self-reliance that we put down. And on reflection, a series of decisions taken by the Menzies Liberal Government were critical in that regard. Between 1963 and 1996, the Menzies Government stared with horror at the inadequacies of a strategy of forward defence as it became clear that the British were intending to run down their eastern commitments and the Americans at that point were equivocal about handling difficulties with Indonesia and not sure of the direction in which their policy would go in Southeast Asia. So the Menzies government responded massively. They acquired DDGs, submarines, F-111s, F1 M113, armoured personnel carriers, and they introduced conscription. Conscription is usually assumed as being based on the exigencies of Vietnam. It wasn't. It was based on the challenges we assumed might be forthcoming from a Sukarnoist Indonesia heavily influenced by the PKI and rapidly acquiring at that point of time a potent array of naval and air equipment from the Soviet Union. This appeared as a very friend this disappeared of course as a very friendly Indonesia emerged from the failed communist coup attempt and the direct American interest in Southeast Asia evolved in Vietnam. Keeping Indonesia friendly is a major Australian interest and interactions between all sections of the Australian military where their Indonesian counterparts has been an important diplomatic part of uh, it ever si uh, that relationship ever since. The force structure left in place by the Menzies government in fact made systematic planning for our defence in the 1980s context much easier. Now for the remainder of the talk I'm going to concentrate on the Navy. Being able to defend our approaches and influence events in our region of direct military interest in the period from 1983 to 96 and indeed today is very much a combined service affair. That was made very clear in our parallel changes in command arrangements at the time. Our commander was made chief of our defence forces, not just simply a chairman of three separate forces. And three joint headquarters were created. To fit the topic, I'm obliged to set to one side the critical role of our Air Force capabilities for surveillance, strike and interdiction 
and the Army's capability to handle onshore and offshore problems, which involve intense collaboration with naval assets in our maritime approaches. Having been stated that these are factors, I will ignore them for the purposes of this conference. The 1980 White Seven White Paper entailed deep consideration of what was described as low-level and escalated low-level conflict. These, this, these conflicts were perceived as producing the most likely threats to our hold on this continent and they required a force in being to meet them. This was because in the similarly elaborate consideration of warning time, we believe these sorts of threats could emerge at any point of time and be very challenging. Nation crushing threats would take much longer to develop and warning time should permit a capacity to respond by enhancing other capabilities that would be kept not so much as being part of a force in being but as part of an expansion base. Closely examining the two types of low level conflicts, low level threats, revealed the possibility of challenges in a substantial array to coastal shipping, wider sea lanes, offshore and onshore critical northern assets and population centres. On our approaches, five choke points were identified in the Southeast Asian and South Pacific archipelagos, which we needed to be able to defend. Defence was not enough. Deterrence was also needed, and that required strike capabilities, so costs could be imposed on an enemy beyond simply the loss of its attacking forces. When this was examined, it was clear to us there was not enough Navy. Then the Navy consisted of 12 major ships and six submarines, as well as patrol boats and other lesser capabilities. These could not protect the points, the choke points, and our approaches. We needed an increased effort. It's forgotten now, but we expect the DDGs to last to the late 1990s. And the FFGs, six of them, there are only four at that point of time, until 2017. The new ANZAC frigates would lift the numbers, replacing the DEs, taking us to a total of 17. Likewise, for inshore war work, mine counter vessel vessels were to be acquired. A substantial elevation of ASW capability was perceived for the ships as a crucial element of surveillance and interdiction. Privately, we knew this wasn't enough. Though the white paper discussed six submarines, our contract entailed the possibility of another two. The force multiplier effect of seven and eight was much greater than five and six. We hope the Kiwis might provide another four frigates for the choke points, picking up four Anzacs, believing a solid defence of Australia's approaches was in New Zealand's interests. I'm not critical here. New Zealand bought two and have a force structure that is superbly suited to the South Pacific, where their expertise and the role they play is enormously helpful to us. Likewise, we don't have 17 major ships and eight submarines. It is easy to see, however, the confidence the government had that these forces would be more than adequate to deal with the need to have a naval component of a more forward diplomacy and with a stress placed on interoperability with US forces and use of US technologies, contributions could be made to allied naval efforts. We thought with such a large navy, with such a broad ocean going capacity, we would readily meet any conceivable allied requirements for collaboration with them. In 1987, however, the forward activities that were envisaged by us were to be pursued, we saw, independently, moving to a two ocean basing arrangement with submarines concentrated on the west coast was a significant force multiplier for the new ships and submarines to be acquired. For submarines in particular, west coast basing improved time on station compared with a Sydney based operation in critical Southeast Asian choke points by one third. 
roles enhancing surveillance and interdiction efforts in the South Pacific were perceived as an independent Australian effort utilising Australian surface assets and support for an extensive political patrol, Pacific patrol boat program. We signed an agreement in 1988 with PNG that elevated our defence relationship with them to an equivalent status to the five power defence arrangement and Marnus was revived as a patrol boat base and the wharf reconstructed to be able to berth an FFG. We were conscious that the battle fleet for Lady Gulf assembled in Marnus. More to the contemporary point, Marnus was adjacent to one of the identified choke points. With the five power defence arrangement, we were conscious of the fact that the need to withdraw the squadron of Mirages will create a degree of alarm with our allies. A continuing operation, if not basic, of F-18s, F-111s and P-3Cs substituted. To indicate our enhanced seriousness, we engaged in some naval diplomacy by telling our partners of our intention to rotate a major naval vessel establishing a near permanent presence in the Southeast Asian region. The naval deployments augmented a major surveillance operation with the P-3Cs. Of particular interest was the augmented Soviet naval operation from Cameron Bay. Our subsequent naval deployments in the Kuwait War settled the private fears in the minds of some Southeast Asian friends about Australian willingness of, uh, the willingness of Australia to forward deploy in the post-Vietnam era. What all this added up to produced, if implemented, a substantial capacity to dominate our approaches if problems went kinetic. In peacetime, a substantial surveillance regime of our area of strategic interests. The same assets in naval terms used diplomatically for confidence building in the region. They were able, available for exercises and patrol operations with our friends, demonstrating seriousness in Australia's resolve on regional security. In particular, it was presented to our allies as a serious contribution to Western security, delivered independently and crucial in a period where in the same region, the American capacity to pursue presence was being diminished by troubles with their Philippines bases. Now, though critical they were of some aspects of the white paper, these factors caused the American leadership to endorse them. Well, it seemed like good plans, but then came a series of surprises which subtly shifted the basis of our planning and the use of our naval forces. They shouldn't really have done so. The focus on the centrality and force structure of the defence of Australia's approaches had resonance in a variety of conceivable geopolitical circumstances, including the changes which occurred. The changes which did occur did not alter the military realities entailed in the examination of Australia's defence needs, but they dramatically altered the psychological environment, environment and the saliency of defence matters in national Australian politics. The three changes which occurred were the collapse of the Cold War, the sudden significance of non-Cold War scenarios to our main ally, and the emergence of thinking about a regional stabilisation role for our armed forces. The collapse of the Cold War did not of itself impinge on our naval operations. They were largely independent of Cold War commitments and geographically outside the main focal points of the Cold War. What it did do was change defence perspectives and government tolerance of expenditures. Before the fall of the Berlin Wall, our percentage of GDP spent on defence was never below 2% and usually midway between 2 and 3. Within a decade of the fall of that wall, our expenditure was rarely above 2%. The US reduction was just as dramatic. A 600 ship navy was halved in 10 years. More subtly, the sense of menace was more distant. And that took the discipline out of planning. No subsequent white paper delved so deep 
into scenarios in determining force structure. The choke points drifted away from centrality in our thinking, and so did a lot of ASW focus, and so did a lot of the discipline which determined that we needed 17 ships. And that was odd, because at the same time, rapid de development in regional naval capabilities might have suggested quantity and our technological edge were going to be more, not less, important. The second change occurred before the end of the Cold War, though it had little to do with it. Though the 1980s structure of the Navy was anticipated to render it capable of supporting Allied operations, the truth is none of us really expected it. Within six months of the 1987 White Paper's publication, however, we were engaged with our ally in the Persian Gulf. The so-called tanker war subset of the Iran-Iraq war induced it. Mining of American civilian ships and mine and missile attacks on international shipping in the Gulf saw the US reach out to friends and allies for escort and ultimately punitive purposes. After considering a, fig a frigate, we offered a clearance diving tree, which was to meet an identified American weakness in countermining operations. More significant than the offer was the argument. The outcome provided guidance for future decisions. 15 years of post-Vietnam reluctance to commit in distant areas was set aside. Officials initially opposed the commitment as one too distant from Australia's direct area of military interest, both geographically and definitionally in terms of national interest. The Americans said it was a test of our claims that our force structure permitted attachment to Allied operations further afield. The politicians detected a direct Australian interest in freedom of the seas. Five Australian civilian ships plied the Gulf then. The British protected them. The Gulf sea lanes were important to us. Given Allied concerns, given the maritime character, this was a legitimate task in the national interest to be performed by the RAN, albeit in least expected times and locations, and it's been so ever since. With limited interruption, from 1990 Kuwait War till today, the RAN has operated in the Persian Gulf Red Sea area. It is a political flag, a gesture of Allied support. It is also effective. Mine clearance divers were critical cleaning up Kuwait and later after the Iraq War Basra. A shallow draft of Anzac frigates have made them excellent counter-smuggling shore bombardment platforms. Our value has been recognised in command arrangements in the region from time to time. Our Navy now has as much familiarity of Middle East waters as it has of our own. Finally, there was a commitment to regional stabilisation arrangements. Now that story belongs to the next paper. These were not anticipated, to tell the truth, in the 1987 White Paper, but their, their possibility was evident in the response to the first Fijian coup. There was no intervention by us, but a presence was established in case of a need for rescue in which the Navy played a prominent role. Cautious approaches were likewise made in relation to problems in Vanuatu and Papua New Guinea at the time. It was not until the post-96 era that regional stabilisation arrangements were added formally as a force structure determinant. But the 1994 White Paper foreshadowed it. Largely unexplained in that White Paper sits a government declaration of a need for two additional amphibious ships. The missions given the Navy between 1983 and 1996, whether they related to regional surveillance, coastal surveillance, fisheries protection, diplomatic deployments, Persian Gulf war fighting, or counter smuggling, counter piracy patrols, naval capacity building, building, demonstration of resolve were done very effectively by the RAN. The Navy paid its way. The question arises, however, did the predominance of those roles, few of which were taxing on ship numbers and none cripplingly expensive, conceal something critical of which we lost sight during those 13 years? Did the good performance and our allies' gratitude smooth the sharp edges of responsibility in the political leadership and the Defence Command? 
I still remember many briefings I had as Paul Dibb prepared his report and then the white paper. The escalated low-level conflict which seemed the most likely of the threatening scenarios. The perception of growing regional military capability offsetting Australia's edge informed then a very hard-headed look at Australia's approaches. The judgment that the force in B had to be able to handle it was firm in all our minds. Our understanding of our geography in realistic threat scenarios was very strong. The Navy that was planned, we understood, to be barely able to handle it, hence the importance at the time of the Kiwis. But that Navy did not emerge. This probably impacted in terms of ship numbers. Further, the anti-submarine warfare component of the mission did drift somewhat away. The talk of self-reliance remained. The understanding that we had a sea air gap in which we needed to predominate was there. The requirement for strike capability for deterrence was understood. But did our structure, in the end, in that period and after, mirror the task. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.